So um, as I was saying, I, I think earlier to you, Connie, I don't have a lot to report from here, but I, I can say um, that we've been in touch with some workers. Um, a lot of, of, as Connie mentioned, um, I think a lot of the workers in PEI are working in fish plants, um, in seafood, in shellfish processing plants. Um, so uh, not all of them would be here yet. There are some, of course, who stay year round. Um, there are also a number of workers in, um, who work on farms. Some are here again, um, some we're uh, hoping will come in within the next few months. But um, so a lot of the workers are here from the Philippines, but we also have Mexican workers and some um, who are here at the time right now. Um, what we're hearing, of course, is some anxiety around income. Um, we've heard from workers and this would include um, workers on farms that there was um, a lot of confusion around instructions and around what the you know the, the depth and the implications of the of the crisis um, there was a lot of um, uh, fear i guess around not being able to send funds home because um, of mobility issues people here generally work in rural communities or in um, rural areas where they don't have a lot of access to transportation so um, and are quite dependent on employers in many cases for trans transportation so um, because of restrictions on the entire population people were um, not able to go and um, to, uh, send money home as easily they weren't able to go and do their grocery shopping so there was a lot of oh my province is prince edward island sorry um so it's the smallest province but we do have a fair proportion of um of migrant workers here and and i think it's fair to say we couldn't function without them and um so so there's some concern around um, obviously income and security around how people are going to support their families um, in their home countries and and really uncertainty and fear around um, friends and family who might be coming or would would normally come to prince edward island to work um, in the season um, so we've been doing um I guess some advocacy, it feels really, um, obviously we're all working in our separate houses, so it's a little bit, um, we haven't, I'd say we're just beginning really the advocacy um, on healthcare, access to healthcare for everybody, because um, especially now that it looks like there will be workers coming, um, new workers coming to Prince Edward Island, we need to make sure they're all covered by healthcare as soon as they get here given this um, health crisis. Um, and of course, making sure that the in income supports um, that have been announced by the federal government are going to apply to workers regardless of their status. Um, the other thing I guess that we're concerned about and are starting to advocate around is would be housing and um, the employer's responsibilities um, to ensure that that all workers coming from another country are um, safe and secure during their period of their two week isolation period. So um, and making sure that everybody has the information that they need. Um, it was really kind of slow getting information out in different languages here. So we're hoping that that would um, happen more quickly. Um, so yeah, I think those are the things that um, that we're working on, and those are some of the issues that have come up. Um, I, Connie probably has been in touch with some of the workers here in um, Western Prince Edward Island, and um, there is a real sense of community there, and a lot of the workers have gained permanent residency over the last couple of years, the last year in particular. Um, PEI has been particularly good at that, I think. Um, and so there, um, some of the people who came here under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program from the Philippines have gained permanent residency, brought family members over, established themselves, and are working um, in 
in other jobs. So they're um, not as affected, but they're part of that commun larger community of, of um, people who came as migrant workers. So there's a real, um, I think it's safe to say that there's a uh, sense that the community uh, is, they're concerned about one another and their, and their secu income security for sure. So we'll be really interested in seeing what kinds of, um, uh, sort of how these programs are going to affect uh, work, migrant workers and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people are doing in other places to make sure that that happens. Um, well, thank you very much, Anne. Um, maybe from PEI to New Brunswick, um, Roland. Um, anyway, maybe we can go to Diwa and, and come back, go back to Roland. Hi. Sorry, I was just trying to put my video on, but it's on safe driving mode. But I guess you can hear me? Yes, yes. So but I'm Diwa Marcelino from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty One. Um, the Granted Manitoba has been working with uh, many temporary foreign workers and migrant workers and newcomers. Um, in the province, we don't have that many migrant workers compared to, let's say, Alberta, Ontario, or even Quebec. We only have a few thousand, like around, around 3,000 usually any given year. Uh, at its height, we had about over 5,000. Uh, many of them were working in the pork product, pork processing sector or the meat sector. So typically about half of the migrant workers are usually residing in Winnipeg, the capital, and they're working in various uh, uh, jobs. Uh, the other half is in the rural areas or the smaller towns, working anywhere from, again, pork processing or hog raising. Uh, to also, you know, just working in retail and hospitality. So the, one of the cases that we have here, many of the cases that we have here are similar to cases that the Grand Canada affiliates face everywhere else in, in the country. We face a lot of discrimination, uh, workers' rights abuses that are related to uh, wrongful dismissals, um, for instance, uh, this past two years, we were working with five women who were, who were fired because they became pregnant. Um, and that has been uh, very difficult. Uh, those types of cases are a bit more difficult because there's a lot of prenatal care that's being, that is required. Uh, usually workers who are fired uh, from the temporary form worker program are not able to access employment insurance, although that's that's changing. And I know that there's been success, especially in Montreal, where workers have been able to get at least three months of EI. Uh, but in general, uh, and for the longest time, workers have not been able to get that type of income support. Um, as well, if you may not you may not know or may know, workers who whose permit permits expire. Also, also have their health coverage expire. So in the case of workers who became pregnant and were fired and were under the temporary foreign worker program, they were unable to, many of them were not unable to get EI and to add insult to injury, uh, they were also taken off the provincial health care coverage. Not in, and it also means that they had to pay out of pocket for laboratory fees, doctor's visits, and ultimately also the labor and delivery. Uh, and we know that could be in the tens of thousands, depending on the complications uh, of the pregnancy. Even in one, even in one uh, doctor's visits and lab fee, one visit uh, almost reached $2,000 for one worker who was in the beginning only earning close to minimum wage and now has no job and no source of income. Um, one of the, one of the good things about uh, temporary foreign workers in Manitoba uh, for the last 10 or 15 years uh, that they've been coming uh, en masse is that workers uh, do have access to PR for the most part, or per permanent residence. So workers often 
apply for permanent residence and the, and the province accepts around 5,000 a year, I believe is still the number. Uh, so many of the workers who come as temporary farm workers within a couple of years become permanent residents. Uh, unlike other provinces, the pathway to permanent residence is, um, is out of reach. Uh, this, of course, excludes workers who are coming to work seasonally under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. In Manitoba, almost exclusively, they come from Mexico to work in the farms. There's about 300 or so, if I'm correct. Um, there's also other workers from specialty fields like apiary or bee yards. So beekeepers usually are coming from the Philippines under the temporary foreign worker program. And I think they stay longer than the seasonal workers. They might be staying uh, uh, closer to the whole year or sometimes year round. Uh, but again, like, like in other places in Canada, although we do have a high success rate of people receiving permanent residence, there are still uh, issues of unjust firing, of people withholding pay, we have issues of migrant workers or temporary foreign workers in very um, terrible housing conditions, uh, also work conditions as well. Uh, we still have workers, almost all workers that we know, um, pay some sort of recruitment fee uh, in thousands of dollars. And because of the, because of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, workers are being infected now more than ever. Uh, we're, we're anticipating that Workers, if they're not able to access the income supports announced by the federal government, uh, we're worried that these workers will be left behind uh, because in, in the past, many workers were not able to get, many temp temporary foreign workers were not able to get EI. Uh, I hope that isn't the case this time and I hope that's inclusive, but we're going, we're going to see uh, very shortly whether they get approved for EI or not with the rest of the country. Um, so right now, what we've been doing as an organization, we've been advocating for healthcare for all, like many other places and many other groups have. We've written letters to the opposition uh, and other party leaders and also the premier and health minister of Manitoba. Um, and we're, we're in talks with our MPs and MLAs, our member of provincial parliament um, in Manitoba uh, to make sure that people have access regardless of status. Uh, Migrante has also been involved with the Access Without Fear uh, campaigns. Uh, this Access Without Fear campaigns were brought about uh, by organizations wishing to give access to workers who have lost their status at some point in their journey here in, in Canada to become a citizen or PR or if they were working. Uh, these include people who are um, failed refugee claimants. We know that for the longest time, refugee acceptance rates were in the 40s, 40% 40 range. Now it's 66% range of the acceptance as of 2018. Uh, but there are still a lot of people who are not being accepted. And when they lose their, their, their case, they become uh, ineligible for provincial health care. So one of the biggest campaigns now is the fight for health care. OK, um, thank you, Diva. So Roland, if you can just go ahead, please. Uh, hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So my name is Roland and uh, my wife is Gina. So he, she's our uh, president of the Filipino Canadian community of New Brunswick. So we're a nonprofit organization uh, uh, aimed to uh, assist uh, uh, temporary foreign workers uh, as they come into uh, the province. Um, I know that uh, we are very unique in Atlantic Canada because we have an Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. And I know for the fact that uh, a, lot, a lot of the employers in here in New Brunswick are using that program instead of the temporary foreign worker program uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, the ability to hire um, foreign workers uh, as, uh, you know, as fast as, as they can. So, um, in you know in the past we have a lot of uh, temporary foreign workers, but same same with Anne that uh, a lot of uh, Filipinos uh, applied for permanent residence and now they're getting it uh, for the last uh, few years, and then they kept uh, they you know um, a lot of them uh, 
still works with the same employer as what uh, they've started with, especially in uh, Sediac, you know, in uh, in Trachity, in in, in, in Saint George, so where the a, a, a piss plant, and also uh, uh, in in uh, in Woodstock, New Brunswick, where is this a big uh, uh, greenhouse uh, greenhouse uh, uh, plant there? So um, we we have this we have we we experienced the same problem as uh, anybody else, you know, um, as as with with Anne's uh, 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 foreign workers that you know uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, they are denied with uh, uh, getting a, a Medicare coverage for Medicare, and uh, basically uh, we are working with our MP. Uh, in Fredericton and even from the other region in, in New Brunswick to uh, provide assistance to uh, to to our uh, uh, you know uh, to our uh, I would say you know client or our friends uh, that for our foreign workers to uh, to have those kind of uh, services. So in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, as a result of COVID, I, we know that um, you know everyone is isolated here, but uh, we're quite worried about the uh, um, uh, number of workers coming in um, in fact we have uh, we have two weeks ago we have uh, nurses from the Philippines that applied uh, from Dubai uh, and they, they came here so they got picked up from the airport but after that they just put in, in a in an apartment and without anything you know they don't have beds they don't have anything in there so my wife and the other uh, Filipino here, so came there and give them uh, uh, give them something and also pick them up and uh, uh, you know uh, help them to to find groceries, apply for uh, C number and everything they have. So it's really impacting us because of mobility and they are quarantined. So uh, so we were in. Uh, Gina has been talking with uh, their employers about you know. Uh, ability because the transportation is also limited uh, in, in our region in here so it's a challenge for for them to uh, to, to be in here so um, and hopefully you know uh, with, with the new guidelines for the temporary foreign workers that was announced last week that uh, they will follow the 14 day quarantine for temporary foreign workers that uh, you know uh, as far as I, I can read it there that uh, they will be even paid up during that time. So I don't know how how is it gonna be uh, implemented. So uh, we will we will, we we've been informing them as they come in here, but we basically rely on uh, on uh, you know word of mouth because uh, we have no access to who are coming in in, in New Brunswick. Uh, we just learned that you know from from Facebook or from uh, word of mouth that you know uh, that they are coming in or they will be coming in in, in New Brunswick. So yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Roland. Um, I Santiago is with us. So Santiago. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Santiago Escobar. I'm a national representative with the Union United Food and Commercial Workers of Canada, and also I'm coordinating the Agricultural Workers Alliance, uh, is which is the, the the banner for agricultural workers across Canada. Um, especially in Ontario, because uh, as some of you know, in, in, in Ontario, uh, agricultural workers are not allowed to join a union. So I would like to report about the work we, <clears throat> we are doing um, when it comes to migrant workers. So first of all, we would like to welcome the federal government decision to allow migrant workers to enter into Canada as they are a vital part of the food supply chain. Uh, these workers make it possible that communities get food on our tables and are very vital to food security. <clears throat> but as you know, the federal government is requesting that once migrant workers arrive in Canada, they must serve a 14 days period of self-isolation so therefore, we claim that these workers must be financially compensated. Similarly, as unionized food workers in meat plants and grocery stores across Canada 
have obtained an increase of $2 per hour, thanks to UFCW advocacy, and also um, have full access to employment insurance benefits, uh, as was already mentioned. And, and in the case of, for instance, in the case of a, a work closure or quarantine in, in the agri-food sector, due to COVID-19, it remains unclear if migrant workers holding a close work permit will be entitled to collect EI benefits as well. Uh, we have shared these uh, concerns with the federal government and we're still waiting to hear back. Um, unfortunately, it's already over almost three weeks that we were, last time we were in touch with the a senior uh, federal representative that is overseeing the temporary foreign workers program. So we think that um, part of the solution would be for the federal government to provide open work permits to these workers uh, if they really want migrant workers to, to get full access to EI benefits and also have labor mobility. And we think that getting EI access should, be, should, should, should not be a favor uh, it's workers' money. It comes off workers' paychecks. Um, and as you know, migrant workers are also paying to employment insurance. Some of these workers have come to, to work in Canada for over 30 years or more. In some of the cases, I met a, <clears throat> last year a Jamaican worker that was 30 years working in Canada. So. Um, migrant workers are at high risk as social distancing is not possible for them due to their accommodation and their, they work in very close um, proximity to each other, which of course is a major concern. Most of these workers are not able to self-isolate since on average they share a house between 20 to 25 or more plus workers, so it's impossible. <laughs> now my little one is, is having fun. <laughs> Give me one second. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, we are very concerned. So we have reached out the federal government, the provincial government, municipalities, because if a migrant farm worker were to contract COVID-19, what steps will be taken by their employers? So we don't know at this point. And further, if a worker who has contracted COVID-19 is due to return home, what is the procedure? As it would not be safe for them to travel as they could pass on the illness and you know all the issues related. And we, we, we have received calls. We're receiving calls from migrant workers across the country and from, from Mexico, Jamaica. Um, just so you know, we have a toll free that allows workers to call uh, a no cost from Jamaica and from Mexico. So they're asking about how to prevent the, the, the COVID-19, especially the, the ones who are here in Canada. So we referred them to Health Canada website uh, initially. However, unfortunately, there is only information available in English and French. So we have been putting out information in Spanish, uh, Tagalog and English based on the Health uh, Canada website. But it's unfortunate that the government is not providing this information. And as far as we know, um, last week and sorry, two days ago in, in, in Limington, uh, a, a worker uh, contracted the, the COVID-19. So hopefully the, the, the government will do something about it because at this point uh, is our knowledge that especially the big uh, mushroom operations, let's say one example, we're talking about 400 workers working in one place. We don't know if they have a contingency plan to address if one worker uh, contracted the, the virus and what steps they will follow. And also we had 
we have uh, we have lighted before the, the the federal government and, and provincial government that uh, to provide I think it's important to provide paths to these workers car workers to get permanent residence um, here in Ontario and in, in Quebec and in British Columbia uh, in British Columbia is is not an easy process so in, in, in they have here in, 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 in Ontario, they have um, under the Ontario nominee program, they have a, a, a program for these workers, but it's almost impossible to obtain the, the, the PR. And in the case of, of BC, it's just for those who are in, in supervising positions and, and, and up. And, um, and, like I said before, these workers make it possible that communities get food on, on, on their tables and our tables, feed our cities. And if they were able to get permanent residence, this wouldn't become a problem in the first place. So I think this is a, a perfect uh, opportunity to advocate that the, the workers should give these uh, women, these men, the opportunity to, to have that option. Um, thank you very much, um, Santiago. Yeah, I'm just going to give a, a very brief uh, sort of update on what's happening here in Ontario. I've been uh, in contact with lots of uh, migrant workers, particularly caregivers. Um, many of them since the outbreak or, well, yeah, the lockdown here in, 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 in Ontario, many of them have been uh, terminated, had been terminated by their employers without notice, like, you know, one case, um, the, the, the worker, the, the elderly that the worker was, uh, you know, looking after was brought to the nursing home and coming back to the house, the employee just told her to look for, you know, to look for a new place to stay and look for, uh, for an employer. Uh, we also have cases of caregivers terminated because they've expressed concern uh, and about their safety of having to you know, to commute back and forth via the public transit and the ward, not only about for their safety, but also for the safety of the children that they're looking after. Um, we, we, we had a case of, you know, um, a worker who was terminated. Uh, oh, sorry. The worker who actually, who was, who, whose uh, employer or the, elderly person that she was looking after was brought to the nursing home. They were advised by the medical doctor at the nursing home to self-isolate for 14 days just because they're not sure, you know, how safe the, the facility is. And, and so it was a huge concern for her when they came home and the uh, employer told her to, uh, to look for other place to stay and look for other employer. So we are helping this worker to, to stay in the place where she is. And we asked, we told her or advised her to report, you know, this case to, uh, to community legal clinic and also to the authority, just in case the employer really forced her to, to leave the house. Um, as far as the, the workers in, you know, in, in, in Kingsville and Limington, uh, they are still working because they're processing, you know, vegetables and food supplies. Uh, they, they express concern, but really they cannot, uh, they cannot say no when the employer is, you know, have asked them to come to work. And in oftentimes they are working for long hours, 10 to 12 hours, um, in the same way that we're seeing workers in groceries in department stores, many of the workers who are working there are, are undocumented and employers know, so they're given more hours without adequate, uh, you know, support in terms of increased salary and also increased protection as far as health and safety uh, gears. Um, and, and I would say that here in, as, as we've been hearing from, you know, members of the CCR and other uh, migrant uh, advocates, um, many of the undocumented workers are impacted and yet they cannot, you know, they cannot go to anyone to, uh, to complain. Um, 
Santiago mentioned uh, about EI and access to EI by closed uh, by workers who are under closed uh, work permits, or they are the workers who are tied to their employers. Um, there is a lot of concern uh, of them not being able to access EI technically because if they if they are terminated and they access EI, the whole thing, um, their whole work permit and status here in Canada is terminated. Although they have 90 days to restore their, uh, their status and that's the time they can get, you know, uh, EI. By the time it's done, they have to look for, for a new employer to be able to stay. And that poses a big problem because it takes a, a while before a new work permit is issued, especially those, you know, uh, industries or work that needs to have uh, the labor market impact assessment. And, and, you know, um, these rest restrictions on employment insurance or access to other benefits mm -hmm. uh, is a big issue for temporary foreign workers. One, they don't know how to access them. Two, they don't know if they are qualified. And, and so there's, there's a lot of, you know, um, concern, worry, and the fact that they are expected to send a home, uh, to send money or, you know, support to their families in the countries where they are from. And considering that, you know, uh, the situation in those countries might probably worse, particularly in terms of accessing EI. So just briefly, what is happening now in terms of advocacy? Uh, we can share that, for example, in Quebec, uh, the Immigrant Workers uh, Center there, Jill Hanley and some groups, are able to support workers who are in closed uh, work permits to access EI. And we are hoping that that practice or that, you know, uh, is, can be shared to other provinces and we can all, you know, uh, advocate that this worker should be able to access EI without having to lose their, their status. Um, in BC, um, the, the organization there, Mosaic, um, also reported that in BC, the provincial government have announced that, you know, all workers, all people in BC, regardless of their status, whether they're temporary workers, undocumented, refugee claimants, international students, should be able and are allowed to eligible to access healthcare. And they are also waiving the, you know, the waiting period. Um, I understand that here in Toronto, we, in Ontario, uh, there is a big push that, you know, uh, the, uh, the province also open up uh, healthcare to everyone regardless of all of their status. And, and, and the need to push back is, I guess for us, is to really uh, target the federal government because they can, you know, uh, uh, impose this under the emergency powers for the, all the provinces to open up and ensure that healthcare is accessible to, uh, to every, everyone, regardless of their status. Um, also, just an, uh, a brief on, of an update, um, the, the Canadian Emergency uh, Response Benefit that the federal government has announced to, to support uh, families and communities, uh, they've been, you know, announcing this, I guess, in the last couple of weeks, but it's only on April 6th that, you know, the whole uh, guidelines and the application portal is going to be open. And we are hoping again that, you know, temporary foreign workers would be able to access uh, this support or this benefit. Um, one of the, well, uh, the, one of the primary reason of having this webinar, you know, is for us to have a sense of what's going on uh, across Canada and how can we support you know, uh, these workers, both in terms of advocating for, for the policies and making sure that whatever provincial or pre federal um, assistance that, that are in place, that these are uh, inclusive of all the people here in Canada, again, regardless of their status. Um, the, we, we are talking about, we have talked about, or um, 
Santiago have mentioned, you know, uh, agricultural workers, uh, the seasonal agricultural workers. In the beginning of the month, uh, the federal government or the minister, prime minister announced that, you know, they are not allowed to come in to Canada. But because of the big push from uh, the farm owners, you know, that, that policy has been rescinded and now they are, they are allowed. The big concern that, you know, we've been raising and uh, Santiago has raised as well is to making sure that these workers who are coming in are accorded with, you know, uh, the, the support and, and the, 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 the necessary things for them to be able to practice social distancing, for example, and access to health care. We understand and we know that those who are living in the farms, working in the farms, have a very, have very crowded and uh, lacking sanitation and hygiene in the, in the accommodation provided to them. And we want to push back and make sure that the government is, you know, uh, conducting or will conduct regular monitoring to make sure that these workers are provided that. Um, provided the necessary space that they need in, in, in terms of, you know, social distancing and, 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 and so forth. Um, so these are, you know, um, these are the things that we're hearing and, and in, in, like in the beginning, we intended to have this webinar to include migrant workers and temporary workers, but the fact that, you know, they are at work at the moment and also um, uh, they might be, well, they might be shy to share their experiences. So we are, we are going to be scheduling uh, a separate webinar just for them. And we can do this in Tagalog and also Pub, uh, Santiago uh, in Spanish, right? So, so that, you know, um, there, is, um, there is easiness to understand in the language that they're comfortable with. with. Um, I think the next step step for us now is, you know, um, what can we do um, as, as concerned, you know, members of the community, concerned members of our churches, and also uh, the unions. Right now, we have with us three big unions. I see La, uh, Laura Ramirez from the, hi Laura, from the Steelworkers Union, and also Louise Castleman, hi Louise, uh, from, from PSAC. And of course, you know, members of Kairos in the different parts of the country. Um, we might not be able to, to come out with an advocacy uh, um, plan or action at the moment, but this is something that, you know, we can, can start thinking about and for the next, in the next webinar, we can all come together with a more uh, focused and, and concrete suggestions in terms of how we can do, we can advocate both at the national level and also in, in educations or provinces that, that we are living. Um, is there um, a question or suggestion or some feedback? From, yeah. I wonder if you want to also, while people are thinking about the advocacy question and about how they might, uh, how everyone might uh, act, if you would want to highlight the documents that you prepared. So I have, I have them that I can screen share if you like. I also want to point out to everyone that I have uploaded four documents into the chat. Uh, just to show you those documents. There we go. This, so um, Connie, why don't you go ahead and tell people what we're looking at here? Yes. So this is a flyer produced by the neighborhood uh, organization based in Thorncliffe, um, and being distributed in, in in the community. And I, uh, we we are going to post this and sharing this with you because this is very um, very important and also. Uh, this is this can apply federally, like in different provinces. Uh, for example, uh, we can apply for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that I was uh, I mentioned earlier, and there is you know a brief uh, guidelines here who can apply and how much is the benefit that you know each person will get per month and so forth. 
Um, the other one is employment insurance. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's, there's um, the, the EI can be limiting in terms of, you know, eligibility and qualifications and so forth. And for temporary foreign workers, especially those uh, in closed work permits, uh, as Santiago mentioned, um, this is very difficult for, for, for workers to, to access. Uh, I've mentioned that, you know, in Quebec, they're a bit successful. And this is something that I guess we can, you know, this is one of the advocacy points that we should be doing in terms of opening EI to all workers, regardless of whether they are uh, on open work permit or closed work permit. Um, the point that um, Sajago mentioned before in terms of the government providing open work, work permits to all workers uh, is, I guess, I think is very crucial at the moment. So that people are not excluded, they should be issued open work permits. And I would go farther and say, this is the opportunity for the government to really show its appreciation to the work of the temporary workers, you know, uh, that they're providing us by, uh, by making them permanent residents. Because after all, the work that they're doing is not uh, temporary. So why do we keep, con why do we continue bringing in temporary foreign workers when they are very, very essential in, you know, in our economy permanently. So the call for permanent residency, you know, um, again is crucial at the moment. This, the, this flyer also, you know, talk about if you think you contracted COVID and so forth. Uh, um, yeah, some links in where you can, you know, um, you can go. I would suggest that, you know, you can make copies of this. We'll post this in, in, in our website and you know distribute it make this available to uh in your community uh, because this is a very helpful uh flyer or document um do you want to look at the advocacy and important links now sure please yeah i just want to mention that you know there are existing uh campaigns uh or advocacy um, I would mention that, you know, for one, the, the, the FCHA house, uh, refugee house, they've written an open uh, letter to the prime minister in, in, you know, advocating for, again, access to EI by, uh, by um, the temporary foreign workers. Uh, I also, Kairos is drafting our, you know, um, our advocacy letter and we will make this available, I guess, in, in a couple of days. Um, the, the Migrant Rights Network is also, have also launched a campaign which is called uh, Call Your MPs. Um, this advocacy is again uh, for people to call their MPs and make sure, to make sure that, you know, uh, temporary workers and documented uh, workers would have access to to health benefits as well as the CERB or the Canadian uh, Emergency Relief Benefit, Response Benefit. Um, in, in, in the document that you have in front of you, uh, so the first one, let's ensure that migrant caregivers, temporary foreign workers, uh, this is, the, this is the, the advocacy letter that or call that the Migrant Rights Network have come up with. Um, now, on rent and financial supports, uh, this link will, you know, provide you or will bring you to um, the, the, the website or, yeah, that outlines the options available uh, for, for people who are facing difficulty in being able to pay their rents. There is also, um, I would say, a, a template. Uh, letter that we can, you know, give to to people we know who are having difficulty being able to pay the rents. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, Shannon. We're going to be um, 
posting this in our website, right? Just so people can, you know. We can do that, yes. Yeah. I know that we are nearing the end of our uh, time. I'm just wondering if, you know, um, we can hear um, from a few people some feedback on how, 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 how did we go? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and if you find, you know, having this webinar and having this conversation on this topic is useful. Hi, Connie, it's Louise Castleman, if I may. Just a few Please. comments. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I just want to thank you very much. This is really very helpful. It's a concern that we have around migrant workers. I would also say that we're very concerned about the refugee situation and we haven't heard any report back from that, but perhaps next time. It's an evolving situation. It's very difficult to, um, to get a, a good grasp of everything. But this has been very helpful, especially because many of the people on the call are really on the front lines of that work and are directly engaged with the migrant workers themselves. So thank you so very much. Yeah. I will look forward to receiving um, ideas you have about future work, ways we could support you. So uh, keep in touch and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Louise. I have a question. Yes. Um, I live in I live in Brighton, Ontario, and there's um, there are apple farms here. So most of the seasonal agricultural workers who who come to Brighton are a group of people from Jamaica. Um, only one has arrived at this point. He has two more days of self isolation, um, and then he will be able to go and start pruning apples. He will be the lone worker here. Um, so I guess my question, I have two questions, and it's been expressed, the concern about safety in the bunkhouses. At this point, you're asking us, I, I believe, um, for, for advocacy to work with the federal government as well as the Ontario government to push them to help the farmers figure out how to provide safety in the bunkhouses as well as in the orchards. Um, I know I'm being specific here because our workers happen to be apple workers. So that's my one question. Um, if we could sort of have some kind of dialogue around that maybe in the next webinar. Um, my other question is would, would we be able to have the email addresses for the people who spoke from the various parts of Canada just so that we might specifically be able to revisit a couple of the um, questions yeah yeah my anyway so thank you so much for for that question and yes um that would be one of the yeah. focus of our next conversation um although i should mention that the haldeman Nor norfolk health network has started to put in place some measures in 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 making sure that you know um self-isolation protection to the workers and and uh, mobilizing the farm owners to participate. One of the things that they're doing is talking to the motels and hotels in the area and, and trying to negotiate if that can be used, you know, for isolation when workers come and needing isolation. But I will, yeah, we will provide more information on that. And, and maybe in the next webinar, we, that's something that, you know, again, our speakers from other places can, can provide updates. Last uh, messages from our speakers, from Anne, from Roland, Diwa, and Santiago. If I may. Yeah, I would like to, if I may, I would like to add just that. So um, those, during this difficult time, um, our union, UFCW, remain committed to assisting uh, migrant workers who are experiencing abuses at work uh, in the process of obtaining an open work permit as vulnerable worker. So we are working business as usual. So if you know that a worker <coughs> needs uh, this resource, so please feel free to, to refer us to us. And just so you know, uh, yesterday we obtained another open work permit, meaning that the IRCC is still working. We're a bit concerned because it took us like 
two weeks to hear back from the government, but seems like they're they're working as usual. So it's a good news for the migrant workers community. Um, I just want to to mention, uh, and and maybe this is my my parting message for this webinar, that we, especially uh, members of the faith community and churches, we have. Uh, a very important role uh, to play in terms of reaching out and, and making these workers more welcome and, and included. I understand that, you know, we have to practice social distancing and so forth, but there are ways where we can still express that uh, without, you know, jeopardizing our, our health and safety. Uh, one of the th one example that I have is um, a worker called me and said she's needing this, you know, um, supplies and so forth. And I said, okay, I'll bring them to you. I'm not going to see you, but I'm just going to to buzz her and and tell you that yeah, the supply is there, so that she can come down and and get it right. So so just just you know um, a a call or a plea. Um, that while we're, we're, you know, we're, ex we're practicing social distancing, that they should make us more closer as a community as we continue to care for each other. Yeah. And, and, and Luis, yes, uh, the issue of uh, the refugees and refugee, refugee claimants, uh, it's, not, it's not lost or it's not forgotten, but that's, you know, something that we will talk about in the next webinar. So should we say thank you, everyone? And thank you for joining us. This is very, very useful and I would say uh, successful. Yes, so far we have about 50, 55 participants in this call. And we will put thank out you. information about the next webinar, which we're anticipating on, I believe it's April 14th. Um, two weeks from now at the same time, we'll put out those, those links in the same channels. So if you received an email, you will see that again in an email. Um, plus, we'll put it up in our social media. Thanks for coming, everyone.